Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, and you're listening to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. This episode is brought to you by Boombox Gifts, memory boxes filled with personal messages and photos from friends and family for your next special occasion. Check it out at boomboxgifts.com. I'm here today with Allie Wentworth. Allie is the author of the memoir and essay collections, Allie in Wonderland and Other Tall Tales, Happily, Allie After, and Other Fairly True Tales, and Go Ask Allie Half-Baked Advice and Free Lemonade. As an actress, Allie starred in films Jerry Maguire, Office Space, The Real Blonde, and It's Complicated, and in TV shows like Nightcap, which she wrote and starred in, and sketch comedy show In Living Color. A native of Washington, D.C., and a graduate of Bard, she currently lives in New York City with her husband, George Stephanopoulos, and their two daughters. So welcome, Allie. Thanks so much for being on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. So happy to be here. (laughs) So you mentioned in one of your books that you have the best recipe ever for chocolate chip cookies. So before we do anything else, I have to know because I'm obsessed with baking chocolate chip cookies and eating them. And- well, here's the thing. I haven't told anybody the recipe. Ooh. And so my bestie, Marisha Hargitay, who is obsessed with it, I won't give her the recipe because mm. I don't want her to make it and then not need me. Mm. I like the need. And yeah. so, and I also give it as Christmas presents. I ah. give like eight frozen rolls. So if I gave you the recipe, I feel like it would mm. hurt a lot of my female relationships. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So maybe I shouldn't start our relationship in this way. Like, well, no, I think, I think <laughs> coming um, in and at some point, everything. I will, I will. Is there, is there I'll, a I'll secret? Tell you what. Is there a secret ingredient or is it just um, the ratio of everything that makes it? It's them the so ratio good? of everything, okay. which I think is very important. I use more butter than mm. more people and I use sea salt. Mm-hmm. There's a few things. Okay. A few tweaks. Yeah. Okay. I will, I won't I will dig. send I won't you dig. a roll and you will <laughs> taste it and I'll get you addicted. There, there will be a want that I only, I, it's, it's like a, it's like a meth addict. Yeah. You know? it's, yeah, yeah. I am. It's a similar thing. It's not hard to get me addicted yeah. to the sugar. No, I, yeah. I, my friends are really, they get angry at me because they say they, I've given them 10 pounds, but I say you have no self-discipline. Yeah. <laughs> Just because I give you the cookie dough doesn't mean yeah. not to eat I'm going to give this to you now. Don't eat it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you try and not do it. In the stressful world, <laughs> do not go for that in the freezer, but... Yes. But just if you need it there. Yes, yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. Good to know. <laughs> so in Go Ask Allie, your latest book, you have some really great one-liners like, don't underestimate the power of the gut when you were talking about marriages. Mm-hmm. Do not hire a hot babysitter. Mm-hmm. That's, That's I, just a good one. That is, to me, a no-brainer, but yet it happens all the time. Yeah. We don't want to discriminate, you know. They could be great babysitters. They could be great, ba- but why? I mean, if you're on a diet, why do you go yeah. into a bakery? My I don't know. You're the one giving the cookie dough. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's right. I'm contradicting myself <laughs> left and right. No, I just, there's no reason, particularly after you've given birth, as I assume you have four times. Yeah, three times. I have twins. Three times. Okay. Um, you don't you, you don't need that yeah. in your visual, is my, is my yeah. feeling. And so. the corollary, perhaps, is you never look as good naked as you think you do. That's true. (laughs) I don't care what kind of lighting you have. (laughs) So you started your career as an actress Mm -hmm. and still do acting. Mm -hmm. How did you morph into also being a writer of these fantastic funny books? Well, I, I mean, I was writing when I lived in LA and I was acting, I was not the girl that would go to the gym. Like a lot of actresses that I was sort of growing up with in LA, they were when they weren't working, they were going to the gym or they were sort of physically fine tuning themselves. Mm -hmm. I wasn't, (laughs) but I was bored, you know, because work is sparse. So I started writing screenplays. And so that kept me busy. And I was actually, you know, making a living doing that. And then when I married George Stephanopoulos and I moved to New York, I thought, well, how do I sort of create a career where you know, I'm not in Los Angeles where most of the shows were shooting at that time, but but where I'm active creatively, but not leaving. And mm-hmm. so I started writing the books. And then when I had my little baby girls, I was writing while they went to school. I mean, my rule was as soon as they got in the school bus, I would work. And then as soon as they walked in at three o'clock in the afternoon, I would stop writing. And that seemed like something I could do, whereas I don't have control on a set. I can't say... Listen, I got to go home and make dinner. Right. Like, I don't care. We're tweaking lighting. You're here till two in the morning and you're going to sit in that freezing cold trailer until we tell you. So <laughs> that was a lot of the reason. That's interesting. Yeah. I, I also love to write and I feel like it's the one thing and, you know, podcasting. It's the yeah. one thing you can do really around your own schedule. Exactly. And, there and is control over it. I, I mean, I did, I was fortunate enough a couple of years ago, I created a show that I starred in and wrote called Nightcap and we did two seasons of that. And because I was the boss, we didn't start production until nine o'clock in the morning because I wanted the girls to go to school. And then we stopped by dinner time. 
And I mean, that never happens. Yeah. And good for you. But what I realized was you can actually shoot a half hour comedy in that time. There's so much time wasted that if you know, like, these are the parameters to which we have to shoot, Mm -hmm. it actually works. But, you know, that seems to be, I don't know why people don't follow that formula. (laughs) I, I really yeah. don't. I don't understand why, you know, my friends in L.A. who are shooting half-hour comedies are, you know, there till 11 o'clock at night. And I go, why? It's yeah. not, it doesn't get funnier the no. later. Or, <laughs> Maybe it does to them. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, so, yes, it's it's all about controlling time. And do you have a preference, screenplay versus, you know, essay, memoir? I I mean, I actually like writing the books because I like writing, you know, sort of my experiences in the first person I have a tendency to, I can just go on and on in that arena as Mm -hmm. opposed to, you know, writing dialogue in a character. Mm -hmm. I find that a little bit harder because you have to kind of put on your acting hat too. Okay. And then I'm sort of acting it out and then I'm crazy (laughs) in more ways than one. So I like doing the sort of narrative in my own voice. Uh, By the way, when I lived in LA, I used to live in LA. I lived off of Wonderland Avenue also. Oh, like, you did? Yeah. On what street? I, I mean, I actually lived on Wonderland, oh like eight something. Yeah. That's so It was fun. so creepy. Yeah. Yeah. And like, so when I was reading what you were writing again, I was like, I, I mean, I was like afraid at night, every night until well, we I, left. I, it was like the creepiest neighborhood and the murders and everything. Anyway, I, so I was relating to what you were saying. You know, my landlord was Freddy Krueger. <laughs> so his mask was in the garage. I mean, you couldn't get creepier than that. <laughs> I mean, I was terrified the whole time. Oh my gosh. One of the funniest parts that I really identified with right now, given all the Instagram craze and everything, yeah. was how you talked about your Instagram addiction. And you set this whole maddening scene where, you know, your friends were doing this and you thought you hadn't been invited. And then yeah. you throw your phone away. And then you say, and you screamed it through the phone. You said, I hate Instagram, only to hear a ping. And then you dove under the bed, digging for the phone like a pig for a white truffle. Yeah. <laughs> so how have you managed this addiction? And also, do you still look at your daughter's feeds? Do they still have feeds? You mentioned that in the book. Yes. So how do I manage this addiction? I'm still, I'm like a investigative reporter with this stuff. I'm still trying to figure it out because we didn't grow up with it. So I'm always, and my kids have to teach me. I'm like, what do you mean? What's a Finsta? What is that? What is that? You know, are you getting dick pics? What's happening? You know, (laughs) I just feel like it's the wild west. And so I, I'm dealing with my addiction, meaning I realize now a lot of it is for work. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's 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 all curated. I don't believe any of it. But I'm I'm concerned for my daughters because there's so much self-worth that comes out of Instagram and there's so much, you know, FOMO and all that kind of stuff. So it's a big topic for me in my house. I feel like I am educating my children in a different way. Like when they come home from school, like mm-hmm. I can't help you with chemistry or math or pretty much every subject. <laughs> but I can tell you that that girl who is wearing a bikini on a public account yeah. has a hole she's trying to fill. And, you know, I do a lot of that yeah. because I just I think it's a slippery slope. But I do a lot of work with the Child Mind Institute. Yes. And we do these panels about social media and it's you know it's really sort of terrifying what's going on and how polarized boys and girls are now because of what they look at and see and so yeah I'm gonna be like the Norma Ray of the social media for teens one day because I, I I'm terrified of it yeah yeah my daughter I let her be on it a little bit last year and she's now 11 and then all of a sudden I was looking at her account and I saw like her friend of Leaks had brought someone else to Jingle Ball. And I was like, oh, how could she have done that? Why didn't she invite my daughter? And I was I like, you know what? I'm getting off here. We're unfollowing these people. I, I can't know. even take, I, I can't know. take I the know. stress of it. I know. It's like, so. it's, it just digs at the very root of all our insecurities. It yeah. just does. And my daughter, she does like a deep dive sometimes mm-hmm. into Instagram. Mm-hmm. And then she's, she knows too much. You know what I mean? I'm like, how do you know that? And she's like, I'm just telling you that, you know, Kim Kardashian is not, you know. And I'm like, oh, my God, you're wi- what a time waster. Yeah. Why are you doing that? Why do you know. care about these people? Yeah. You know, so it's it's a little, it's a little crazy. <laughs> but Child Mind Institute, so I'm on the board there. Yes. I've seen you. You moderate the lunches every year, and you're mm-hmm. so great and funny and the dinners and everything. How did you get involved? Did Harold Kapowitz sort of rope you in, or did you? Well, he um, does – Eventually, but I... And also, Child Mind is a research and treatment center for children's mental health disorders for anyone who's listening who doesn't know. Yes, and it's it's a fantastic place. place. And so I have 
a very close friend in LA who sort of runs a philanthropy for the Creative Artists Agency. And so she works with Harold all the time. And when I was moving to New York, she said, you should, you know, this is in your wheelhouse. You should talk to Harold. And so I kind of put my toe in the pool and then Harold pulled me right in, <laughs> submerged me. But I'm there because I believe in the work that they do. And I have been very fortunate at times to have friends whose kids were in crisis mm -hmm. and I was able to call Harold and get them in and yeah. have seen amazing results. And I have a daughter with both daughters have anxiety. So I feel like at this point in my life, I feel like any kid that doesn't have anxiety, there's something wrong with them because yeah, it's an anxiety making world in general. So yeah, so, and I, I love doing those panels because I sort of think that if it's too dry, if it's just some doctors talking mm -hmm. about it, it's, yeah. it, you don't take it in as much. And as just a mom, I try to be that relatable person and sort of make it engaging in a way that, I, cause I know I tune out. If it was like a TED talk on you know, children and teenage anxiety disorders, I'd fall yeah. asleep. So it's more about entertaining myself. But if it entertains well, other people, it's great too. It definitely, it entertains me every year. So that's well, great. And that, my yeah, friends always want to come back. In the book, you said you wanted to name your child Zoloft. I thought yeah. that was so funny. That, you have so many great lines like that. Thank and you. So funny. And speaking of lunches, you have a whole section about the importance of ladies' lunches. Not yeah. the ones like your mom or my mom probably used to have. Yes. But sort of where you, you know, as you were saying, dive deep into issues. And you said, I don't do chit chat. I don't care where someone bought her suede boots or what day of the cleanse she on. I want us to speak honestly about the realities of being women, mothers, and wives. I want to know if you wake up covered in sweat, can have an orgasm without equipment, or are convinced you have an undiagnosed infectious disease. <laughs> so tell me about your relationship with your girlfriends. How has this been so helpful? How often are you are you going to these lunches? Is this well, like weekly? Or? It's not. It's not like a set time. Yeah. Because you know everybody's working and has kids, and you know we sort of figure out like what's everyone's first week in March like. Right. But I found that. Over the years, I have gotten my best information from my girlfriends more than anybody else. Yeah. And information like I have a friend, Tracy, who's like a doctor. You know, she's mm -hmm. an actress, but she's a doctor. I go to her with all my, like, my daughter needs surgery for this. Well, you got to talk to this person that, you know, she knows everything about that. And besides that kind of information, if I'm sitting around with my sort of six girlfriends there's no chit chat. We somebody cries at all times. Like there's somebody, there's something going on. Somebody's having a problem with a toxic person at work, and we talk about that. Somebody's having a marriage issue. Somebody, you know. So there's big things to tackle, and we sort of feel like we're not interested in getting together and talking about like you know, does that kale thing work for you? It's we go deep very quickly, and I think it resolves stuff. And there's also a sense of comfort. And one of the other things I say about in my book is, it was a huge relief for me to realize that my husband didn't have to be my best friend. Mm. There's a lot of pressure. I think women think like the perfect marriage is oh we're best friends like we do everything together. My I, no, yeah, no. I mean George, I love George and all the important fundamental things we share, but. He's not going to sort of chew on a marital issue with me that belongs to somebody else for an hour. He doesn't care enough. Right. You know what I mean? And I always use an example that if I said, oh, my God, I, I just found out that Lucy and her husband are getting divorced. George would go, oh, my God, that's so sad and move on. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> I want to know why. What yeah. happened? Is it going to happen mm -hmm. to me? You know, it's it's I need to chew on it. And my female friends will. Hmm. And they'll also just go deep on a lot of things. I think husbands are like, they're such problem solvers that their feeling is like, oh, well, if this is happening, this is what you should do. And my feeling is like, no, we need to, as my mother would say, shake it out and lay it down. And like we have to really like look at the whole thing and then, and then be okay with it. So, so is this part of the secret? You said your dirty secret is that you have a really happy marriage and that's like not really on vogue anymore. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you have to hide it. Well, that's part of sort of what was a revelation to me that made it my marriage better was that I didn't put all the pressure on him to like be that best friend. Like, you know, he just, like I said, he's not going to go 45 minutes into why Lucy's getting divorced. My girlfriends will. Mm -hmm. And so if I know I can go to them and go, I don't understand it. Isn't that scary? And like, why are they getting divorced and not us? And, da, da, da. and he was having an affair and how did she not know? And I, I can do that with them. Right. And I won't instead then get mad at my husband and go like, I want to talk about this. Why would I talk? You don't have no time for me. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it sort of goes off the rails that way. It's funny that 
the thing with marriage is that there was a while where people were really bitching about their marriages a lot, and mm-hmm. I had really nothing to complain about. And then I started to feel like, well, I have nothing to say. And so I'm somebody that likes to talk. So when I'm at sort of social situations and everybody's complaining about their husband and I have nothing to say, you know, I need to, maybe I need to come up with something. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, I started to feel like I noticed that we started hanging out, you know, you start hanging out with other couples that are happily married or, mm-hmm. you know, because it sort of reinforces everything. But also it's like you just have a lot more in common. Mm-hmm. And I did notice, too, that I have friends that have very sort of complicated marriages that end up hanging out with other people that have very complicated marriage. You know what I mean? Like the unhappy seek out the unhappy or the unfaithful seek out the unfaithful. And so then I just made a joke about how we, you know, meet at Polish restaurants right. in Queens late at night with other happily married couples because it's, you know, we don't want to get caught. It's so true. I'm divorced and remarried. I feel like my friends from my first marriage are now so different in part because, you know, I feel like a few friends felt like I was abandoning them by actually like getting divorced. Right. Do you know what I mean? Right. Like, I'm like, well, anyway, that's enough of that. But, you know, think. Well, no, you friends were unhappy even, and you made yourself happy. Yeah, so anyway, <laughs> another part that I really liked in your book, which I felt like was a fast forward into where I'm going to be at my own life in a, in a couple, not, not that soon because my littlest is still four. But at some point, the moment when you were sort of at your beach house in the kitchen and debating, is it too depressing to go to a farm stand now and buy one ear of corn because your girls were away and your husband yeah. was working yeah. and you were alone in the house and you said you were on the other side of life and scrambling to find purpose. She said, when I was young, time was irrelevant. Summers were endless and the possibilities were infinite. But now standing in my kitchen in a still house, wondering if it's too depressing to go to the farm stand and buy one ear of corn, I realize that this is it. Oh, that's so sad. I wrote that. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Well, I will say I have friends who are empty nesters now and they're sort of scrambling and sort of freaking out and what am I going to do and who am I? And oh my God, I'm alone with my husband now. Right. I mean, my girls are in eighth grade and 10th grade, but you know, I, I see it. Mm -hmm. I see it, but I'm already dealing with that emotionally. I'm preparing myself so that that, and how I'm preparing is I have kept kind of a steady profession going, but Mm -hmm. you know, I will probably delve more into work when they're out of the house because Mm -hmm. I think women need to, I think you need to have these other things. And I think I'm going to be the mother that demands everybody home for Thanksgiving and Christmas. And I don't care, bring your boyfriend. Like, I I know I'll be that person. My mother's like that. Mm -hmm. Like, we're all going out to San Francisco for my brother's birthday soon. All of it. You know, I think that if you are a mother that sort of dictates how important family is and we will get together no matter what, no matter how old you are, then, you know, it kind of, that lives on. But there is, you know, there I am very wistful about, when we were painting rocks and on the beach, you know, those were great times. Those were just days that, you know, went on forever where you're just at the beach and you realize, oh, it's, you know, the sun setting, we'll go home and have chicken fingers. And like, those were, to me, those were the best of times. I mean, a a lot of women would say, oh my God, that's the worst. Your kids are crying. I don't know. I I love that period. I really did. I feel like even looking back on my own life, that was my favorite period. Yeah, me too. It's like when I was a little girl on the beach, yeah. and outdoor showers, and yeah, you know too. that whole thing. So. We we were in Cape Cod every summer, and I remember feeling like the days they just were endless, and I would could just yeah. lay on a porch, you yeah. know, and maybe I had a tennis lesson or you yeah, went to the beach, exactly. but you know those were your big worries. My only distraction was Snoopy tennis. Do you remember that little game, Snoopy tennis? It was yeah. like on that little thing with the batteries. Yeah, that were yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, I feel like it was like the beach and Snoopy tennis yeah. and books, and that was like my summer. Yeah, much. yeah. <laughs> and also, we didn't have a TV. Like my mother didn't have the TV in the summer, so we really were. Yeah. It was like go outside with a stick and a rock and figure it out. So. Yeah. I made this rule a while ago, which now I've basically given up now that I have four kids. But I used to have this rule where we could only watch TV if it was raining. So I feel like if it's raining, fine. Like, yeah. go enjoy it. But on a pretty day, no. That's a good, that's a good rule. So, what yeah. if it's kind of sprinkling? Well, then we got into this whole gray territory. Yeah. And, you know, then it didn't rain for a while. We were just freaking out. Right. So. I found when I was young, my mother only allowed us one hour of television a week. And I found when I got older that... I wanted television so badly Mm because I didn't have it. And now, even when I'm home cooking, I turn the TV on because I can. 
Right. And I yeah. sort of equated a little bit with when my kids were little, the friends are, that weren't allowed sugar. Yeah. And they'd come over and they'd be in my pantry, like choking on marshmallows. Yes. <laughs> so with my kids, I'm like, you can watch TV. You know, when yeah. you're done with your homework, you can watch TV. Because I just know I became so, yeah. all I wanted was TV. Go to friend's house and watch TV, 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 TV. So I don't want them to be like right. that, even though they're going to be watching it on their phones or they'll have like a chip in their head by the time, you know, they have kids. But I found that anytime you sort of take away too much, they want too much. Yeah. I interviewed this man, Gary John Bishop, and he has kids and he's sort of a self-help guru. Mm-hmm. And he was saying everything you do in parenting is direct reaction to how you were parented yourself. I think that's and true. That's like either you do it exactly the same or completely the opposite. Yeah, but nothing is just random. You know, it's always some sort of response. I totally agree with that. Um, that's, I feel like I do that. I'm a little too lenient with sugar because I feel like that was really restricted in my house. And now yeah. with my kids, I'm like, oh, let's bake brownies again. And yeah. they were doing some like make pretend thing about like, oh, let's pretend we're mommy. And they're like, here would you like a brownie? I was yeah. like, all right, maybe I took this too far. Oh my God. I hope my kids never <laughs> have to act out mommy. But yes. Yeah. But you know, I do. I think that's true too. Yeah. I think the reaction is, I mean, we, we force, you know, George's father was a priest. And so the, their meals were not always together because he was always the church. Mm-hmm. And my mother was working in the white house and she wasn't around a lot for dinner. So we have family dinner every single night. You know, George and I won't go out during the week mm-hmm. unless it's really important. Like, really re- have to, have to, not mm-hmm. should, have to. Mm-hmm. And I think that's also a reaction. Like, we had these sort of ideas of one day when I get married, I'm going to have family dinner. Like, we're going to mm-hmm. sit around and do roses and thorns and we're going to, you know. And so, yes, I think. And then, of course, you try to throw away the stuff that wasn't so great about your right. life. Like, I don't spank anybody. Right. <laughs> I won't even go into that. That could be like a whole nother hour. (laughs) One of the funny things your mom says, speaking of like parents, is, you know, her advice to always go to the Four Seasons, basically. Can you tell the story about, I mean, this isn't even so funny, but on 9-11, how, what happened with the... Yeah, so she has this thing about, you know, in a crisis, go to the Four Seasons. Like, if you're mugged, just go to the Four (laughs) Seasons. So it's really ingrained in me. And every once in a while, somebody will say to me, well, actually, really, it makes sense. (laughs) <laughs> so it was 9-11 George and I were engaged we weren't married yet and I was in New York and 9-11 happened George was at ABC News nobody could call like I don't know if you remember but like cell remember. phones nothing yeah. was working except of course my mother was able to get through to me because she's so formidable that cell phones won't <laughs> stop her she was like what's going on I said I don't know there's you know the terrorist attack and my mother said go to the Four Seasons and I said okay <laughs> And finally, George had made his way back to the apartment. And I said, we have to go to the Four Seasons. Now, we were on West 86th Street. And he was like, what? I said, we have to go to the Four Seasons. He said, that, we're going down towards Ground Zero. We're not going to Midtown Manhattan. I said, pack your bag. We're going to the Four Seasons. My mother's just going to the Four Seasons. So we go to the Four Seasons. <laughs> And of course, nobody's there. And we're sitting, we're sort of sitting around. He's dealing with new stuff. And he was like, I don't understand why we're here. I said, we're here because if it's the end of the world, at least we can watch it with room service. (laughs) And he still makes fun of me because, you know, we were not even married yet. So we were at the point where he did what I said. But um, (laughs) it's funny, but my mother will still, she'll still say that. I mean, if if I called her right now and I said, oh my God, it turns out I have the flu and pneumonia. She'd say, go to the poor seat. (laughs) And I'd go. And it would be very costly. <laughs> so do you, with slightly older kids, 8th and 10th grade, my older ones are in 5th grade, do you have any sort of New York City parenting advice, sort of isms, things you've learned that maybe if you were in my seat over here, you might have wished you'd known? That deal with New York City specifically? It doesn't have to. But I just felt like in a, you know, in several yeah, years, I'll be. <laughs> yeah. I would say watch and educate the social media world. I think that's really important because, I mean, I I see how it affects my kids, but I see it with others. And I'm talking about girls being sexualized Mm -hmm. and I'm talking about boys who feel they can sort of judge girls. Mm -hmm. I remember one boy on my daughter's Instagram wrote, you'd be cute if you had boobs. And that really had an effect on her. They start to think the likes are, you know, Mm -hmm. important and they do get addicted. I mean... You do have to set rules. You do have to say there's no phones at dinner and there's no phones so you finish your homework. And, you know, it's dopamine. It's Mm -hmm. the same as when you play the slots in Vegas. The other thing is, even with that, I noticed that my older daughter, she doesn't feel like she has to go out with her friends on a Saturday night because she feels like she's connected to them Mm, with social media. And 
we encourage her to go to the movies, you know, socialize, make eye contact, have empathy, like all the things you're losing. So that to me is the biggest thing to look at. And I think especially with teens, because the suicide rate is so much mm-hmm. higher now because of it. I would also encourage you to be very talkative with your kids. I find that the parents that don't have a great communication with their kids, their kids are the ones sort of off juuling and vaping and mm-hmm. you know doing all kinds of stuff. Whereas my kids, I made myself very available and I didn't judge them. And I've always said to them, I'm the mom, like, you know, your best friend's drunk and throwing up all over you. Please call me. Mm-hmm. And I think those conversations are really really important and because you know new york is fast it's it's a fast city and Mm -hmm. and they see a lot and they experience a lot and sometimes they don't really know what's going on Mm -hmm. and what they're experiencing and so if you can be that person i also am i really believe in sort of showing your kids charity that isn't going to a black tie ball. Mm -hmm. So I took my kids to Puerto Rico. I took my daughter to Burundi, Africa last summer. I think the more they can see it, the soup kitchen, the, you know, anything, because I think that private school, sort of Upper East Side kids, they see charity at, they do, they think it's, it's a a ball, you know what I mean? Like bone marrow gala (laughs) is, it's about Kesha singing. Like there's a huge disconnect. And so I sort of, believe in getting our children's hands dirty a little bit and you know the money stuff is always a big thing Mm -hmm. I mean you know we're not good at it but we're trying to kind of this is your allowance Mm -hmm. and that's it and you figure it out there's not an endless supply of money for Mm -hmm. you if if you're going to the movies tonight then I guess you can't get that mascara later in the month because there's this feeling particularly in this environment that like you can just do and have anything you want anytime you want Mm -hmm. so I We kind of push against that a little bit. And the greatest thing was my husband just renewed his contract at ABC and it was in the papers and everything. And then, you know, which is always gross. You don't Mm -hmm. want people to. But my daughter was like, oh, my God, I saw, you know, in the New York Post, you know, oh, my God, Daddy, that's so great. You're making so much money. He goes, oh, no, no, we're going to mom and I are spending it now. So when you're out of college, you're going to be poor <laughs> because we're, you know, we live on salary and we're going to spend it. So you need to figure out what you're going to do. And, you know, and she was like her face turned <laughs> and she got freaked out. But, you know, you do. There is that entitlement thing that we're constantly battling against. So we're trying to instill in them now, like, no, you need to go work and figure out what your life is going to look like because yeah we did yeah so that was great those were a lot of great thank you yeah they're pretty good yeah Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. look at me (laughs) so are you going to be writing more books like what do you have coming up next do you want to do more screenplays i'm the the, you know i always say my career is like you throw a lot of spaghetti against the wall so uh, i'm going to write another book i'm going to i think write a humor book called how to grow a teenager that's awesome and then i'm talking to audible about doing a podcast awesome Again, something Excellent. you can do and then there's a couple tv projects i'm working on but as as a producer because you know I'm staying at home with my kids till they leave then as soon as they're gone <laughs> all this, it's all yeah. about me all the time but <laughs> yeah so there's like all lots of different stuff going on on the writing front last question do yeah. you have any advice to aspiring writers yes i do you know there's like this cliche line that is the act is in the doing and so many times I found myself guilty of it I would say oh you know I want to write a movie about this or I want to write a book about this or I hear people say like I would love to write a book about this woman and her husband and they go to Africa and he gets killed and it's his thing you know and I go well then write it and my feeling is just write it write it and don't judge yourself. I think too many people write a paragraph and they go, oh my God, this is terrible. And they turn it off and they watch Netflix and they can't go back. <laughs> and I always say, vomit it out. Just just write it out. It can be complete garbage and you go back and fine tune and fine tune. And I found that really freeing for myself because I could just, all right, I'm going to write, I'm going to write a chapter about how I did this podcast with my friend mm-hmm. and on Park Avenue. And then I would just write it out, write it out. And I don't care if it's terrible. There's all kind of spelling mistakes. And then I go back and I edit and edit. And then before you know it, it's actually not bad. But the writing is not going to be done until you literally have your coffee, sit your ass in the chair and just do it. You have to do it. 
Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, sometimes I'm like, I'm like a non-practicing writer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, but you when I don't it. do it. No, you no, I, it. I, I <laughs> But that's great advice. Okay. Anyway, well, thank you so much for thank coming you. on Moms. I don't have time to read books. Yeah. Thank you. This episode has been brought to you by Boombox Gifts, memory boxes filled with personal messages and photos from friends and family for your next special occasion. Boomboxgifts.com. Thanks for listening to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Uh-huh.